All right, we're live on video. Stand by for audio. Good day and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to another new episode here in 2019. And yes, I've got another new guest co-host for you. We might be talking about some health. We might be talking about some lifestyle. We might be just a little bit talking about whispering, specifically body whispering. And uh, I'm excited to talk more about this. So let me dig into your guest co-host today. She's just a bit medical intuitive with the ability to see a person's energy and hear his or her spirit. Um, during private sessions, she acts as a translator for a person's spirit, allowing each person to receive guidance on how their body and their life got to where it is today. She shares the wisdom that she has learned from the spirit world in her book, her videos, and her online course. She gets busy, uh, but she helps us to understand more about how your physical symptoms are actually frequently messages from your own spirit, guiding you towards better relationships, increased clarity, and complete healing. So without further ado, welcome to the show, the body whisperer herself, Christine Lang. Thank you, Scott. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to catch up. So let's, let's just dive right in. I mean, seriously, okay. are, 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 you, are, you gonna, are we going to whisper today? <laughs> of course. I think we're going to whisper course. today. I'm going to have fun with this. <laughs> so what, what, let's just go ahead right here from the beginning. How does one become a body whisperer? Well, well, probably not by following the path I took uh, to do this <laughs> route. I started off as a lawyer, not your typical first step. And in law school, I developed allergies, not asthma, but upper respiratory stuff, just the sneezing and watery eyes and was just constant. And this is before the days, this is back in the you know, 80s and 90s, before the days of like all the meds they have now that don't make you drowsy. So my options were take a Benadryl and drink Diet Coke all day to keep myself awake in law school, or walk around with a box of tissues, and, and both those options suck. So when I got out of law school, I just became obsessed with finding, finding a better way and started studying alternative medicine. And I just like pursued it like another law degree, and I studied herbs and supplements and homeopathy and flower essences. And the stuff that worked, like homeopathy, it, it didn't make any logical sense. And so that got me into studying a little bit of energy medicine, which made me go into quantum physics to kind of understand from a scientific energetic standpoint, how does that stuff work? Um, and along the way, I started making the link between my stress levels being high and my allergies being worse. So I started meditating, started studying Buddhism, started mm -hmm. learning how to do energy like Reiki and energy healing. And before I offered a friend an energy treatment, I would say, well, let me go upstairs, take off my lawyer suit and meditate just to change channels in my brain because I'm in this aggressive lawyer mode. And when I would do that and I would sit and meditate, I would just hear like a word or a phrase about my friend and her symptom. And I just thought they were just random thoughts and I would usher them away and they'd come back. And I started sharing them with my friends and they're like, how do you know that? That's accurate. Who is telling you this stuff? And so I said, I really don't know. And I went back upstairs, sat down to meditate and said, who am I talking to? And my spirit said, welcome home. And just tears started rolling down my face. And she said, this is who you came here to be. Get ready. And then I would sit in meditation for hours a day. And she would say, this is what it feels like when somebody has blood pressure medication in their system. This is what it looks like when somebody's lungs are compromised. And she started explaining to me what I was starting to pick up energetically on people. Hmm. And so I am self-taught in every sense of the word. <laughs> so I started, you know, having friends get better and tell their friends about it. And pretty soon, and how I long goes this? I mean, when did this all get? Twenty years ago. <laughs> really? So. I mean, I, I saw the number, and I'm like, it, was it twenty years since the legal? Was it all together wrapped into one? That's what I was wondering. So. So I would say about 19, 20 years ago, it started happening to where I had enough people that I had to practice. Um, I was married back then, and my husband came home at one point, he goes, uh, I think you have a practice because there's people sitting in our living room like it's a waiting room and I don't know any of them. <laughs> I was like, okay, I have practice, <laughs> time to rent an office. So, you know, now doctors will send people to me when they can't figure out what it is. Either Western medicine, you know, the tests are inconclusive or they know what it is, but it's something like IBS or Crohn's or chronic fatigue or something that Western medicine doesn't have a lot of great options for. And, and they know there's an emotional component. And so they send them to me and, you know, I think thorough healing involves looking at the source, not just the source on the physiology end, but the source on the emotional end mm -hmm. to 
deliver complete healing. And that's my job is to kind of deliver, you know, I think we were raised in our generation was raised to see the body like a bio machine, like a car and your parts are going to wear out. And eventually you're going to have to go to the mechanic also known as a doctor. And he's going to either replace those parts or give you medicines to suppress the fact that that thing is happening. Mm -hmm. and, oh and we walk around frustrated with our body all the time because it doesn't do what we want. It's the car that has a mind of its own, it starts steering and going where it wants to go. And, you know, through my work, I've come to realize from channeling people's spirits that your body is actually on your side and your spirit is using your body like a giant answering machine to send you these messages, which you call symptoms, but you keep erasing the messages without listening to them. So your spirit mm -hmm. sends you another one. <laughs> so We ignore our symptoms. Chase, yeah, and we chase these symptoms around and so by the time somebody comes to me, I'm usually the last resort, right? I'm not your first call. People think what I do is really out there. So I'm that last call and that's fine. When I was a lawyer, I wouldn't have come to see me, right? <laughs> it's very, very out there stuff. But by the time people come to me, they've had this, they've been chasing these symptoms around like you're following a hummingbird around your yard. They seem random. It doesn't make sense. And then when you start hearing the message of what it's about, you go, ah, oh, that makes sense. And then the symptom can release and you can heal it using all kinds of modalities. Well, would you also say then that, because I mean, I, I have to admit, when you, I think it's funny because I think each of us in some way uh, become more attuned to our bodies and our mindsets as we learn to calm down or maybe start picking right. up things like meditation. So aren't some of us starting to maybe get a little taste of that whisper of, of Absolutely. on ourselves? Okay. Absolutely, because it's, I always, if you think of intuition like a dial, like a volume knob, right? And, and mine's just cranked all the way up, but everybody has it. And so yeah. it's just, you know, it's just how loud you make that. And, and you're right. The more still and quiet you get, the more you can hear or know what's going on within you. Absolutely. That I fully support because I, I mean, compared to years ago, and I still, I, I don't even say struggle with it. I would say I, I challenge myself when to incorporate meditation at the right time. And mm -hmm. it's true. It's, 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 it's not easy for a lot of us to quiet the mind enough. Oh, like God, using yeah. meditation. We're just go, go, go. And we're, especially here in the USA, we have a society of just hard chargers. I'm guilty of it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, we also, were, we also grew up at a time where your status, part of the status is being super busy. Mm. So if you're not super busy, you're assumed to be not that important. That's, that's a good point. Actually, it's, it becomes a brag, right? Like people are like, what are you up to? You're like, oh man, I'm just I'm crushing it. You know, right. I'm, I'm, nobody I'm, says I lay around on the sofa all day Sunday and their friends go great. Right. <laughs> Nobody's I'll be perfectly that. honest with you. Right before I came on this, I, oh. I needed some downtime today and luckily it's pouring down rain and I'm looking forward to taking our Calvin, the coon hound out to the park. <laughs> and he was lounging next to me on the couch. And I said, you know what, let me, let me lounge you for a little while. And I, I've been wanting to do this little framing project. So the uh -huh. TV was off, you know, I'm not, doing techie stuff. And I'm sitting there just working on, I'm actually literally framing my degree that I never framed. <laughs> it's like, I just had me going through old records this morning, just doing uh, stuff. And I was like, Oh, you know what? I've always wanted to frame that <laughs> for some reason I just never framed it. So, but it's just fun little artsy craftsy things. But it was nice yeah. to just stay unplugged. I made myself, I left the phone in the office here. I knew you and I were gonna be chatting today. And it's like, let me just hang with Calvin the Coonhound. And we actually had, had it for like an hour, hour and a half. Like I finished it, grabbed a book. I'm really bad at reading a book. I prefer <laughs> audio books, but I made right. myself read a book. <laughs> <laughs> right? So this well, is a good this example. Think, like we're hard charging. And I would describe that not as meditation, but as quieting behavior. Right? Okay. So if you're doing something that's quieting, it's turning the volume knob down on that, on what I think of as the hamster wheel. I mean, most of us, from the minute our feet hit the floor in the morning, we get on that hamster wheel and we just run, 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 run until we give ourselves permission mm. to get off at night and either, you know, grab a drink and sit and watch an hour of junk TV and then go to bed or whatever we're going to do as our slight wind down as we get off that hamster wheel. But if you can purposefully slow that wheel down to almost nothing and you're just strolling on it, you already start getting more intuitive. Things start coming to you and you start owning what's your experiences emotionally inside. That's powerful too. Yeah. I, I will admit this. Like last night, we actually, I, would, I plan on doing the framing because we went out last night to grab actually some framing supplies. I, want, I have a couple of events coming up soon. I want to do some, some nice dress shirt shopping with my fiance last night because we're getting ready for our wedding in, in March. So it's like, all right, let's go shopping together, which I hate. And, uh, <laughs> and, I, and then let's grab a dinner afterwards. It was nice. It was all low key, not picking up the phone once, just go uh, dealing with this shopping thing. 
uh, it's awful. And then going to a dinner and then getting the framing supplies. It was nice. Uh, and then we, we, we just lounged on the couch last night and it was nice. We don't do this enough. So right. quieting. And then I say, you know what? I knew today uh, with the bad weather and I'm preparing for a CrossFit competition next weekend, but I needed to take a day or two off because I injured myself. So I said, all right, let's, it's recovery mode this morning. So I, I literally okay. grabbed a post-it last night and I said, all right, I'm going to set four goals in the morning, but I'm not going to hard schedule my whole day. Right. I want to let, let things unfold and see how the flow state, I love talking about flow state, yeah. develop throughout the day. So, mm -hmm. so admittedly, sitting with Calvin was not on there, but that was in a three-hour open window that I never actually, you know, filled uh -huh. out. I had goals of, you know, you know, hanging out with Calvin in the morning uh, to take him outside, obviously, making my, my French press coffee like I always do. That's my zen experience. I hand grind it. <laughs> Um, okay. I'm That's your moving that. meditation, right? Right. Yeah. I, oh, yeah. Trust me. My coffee grinding is very meditative. Uh, a lot of people are like, "You hand grind your coffee?" I said, "Yeah." It's been a thing for over a year now. I'm loving well, it. Well, that's like going to church for some people, right? That's your temple of being in that space. I yeah. Guess. Yeah. And now some people might not support coffee as a stimulant. And I said, "Well, at first thing in the morning, I look forward to it. I fire up my little electric ceramic tea kettle, like they have in England and Europe, yep. and." Do my thing. It's it's I, nothing else is going on. The phone has been touched yet. I'm just hand grinding. It's a couple that's of minutes your, of that. But those are your meditative experiences, and that's like like in Zen Buddhism when they talk about like, can you bring reverence to just taking off your shoes and placing them inside the door? It becomes mm -hmm. your own meditation because it's your way of acknowledging something that is important or profound or serves you. Hmm. Okay. I like the connection on Buddhism, by the way. We don't talk about that enough on this show. And oh, well, I'm Buddhist. You'll get plenty of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody's got different uh, uh, faiths or followings, and I believe in respecting and admiring all, um, I I, unless it's a very negative and destructive. Uh, well, if it's based uh, on hating or fearing others, I don't have much use for it. But if it's, if it, I, you know, when my kids, when I was, you know, raising my kids at one point, they were in, you know, high school, middle school, and and they were just challenging me and said, well, does that mean we have to be Buddhist if you're a Buddhist? And I said, I don't care if you worship a mushroom. What <laughs> I, it has to pass this litmus test where it has to give you enough answers that you feel secure in the world. It has to help you strive to be a better person. And it has to make you feel safe and heart warmed. And if it passes those tests, then I don't care what it is. And so they each have arrived at their own you know, conglomerate from a little bit of Christianity, a little bit of Judaism, a little bit of Buddhism. And... You know, that's to me the essence of spirituality is just, does it like serve that. you in those ways? Because I'm, I'm not very, I say it all the time, like I'm not air quotes for the, for the, uh, the listeners since we do have <laughs> video. Uh, I don't have this hardcore religious commitment, but right. I do believe in the power of finding things in your life that positively influence you to create faith. Uh, to create faith in yourself and the faith in others. And some, right. for some people, structured uh, religion helps them with that. So sure. we don't really talk about religion on this show, but I'm like, I still understand the value right. of having faith. And uh, at least they, I truly believe uh, there's enough negativity going on in this world. You need to find something that positively can flip your brain and Absolutely. keep you in a positive state. Well, you, you say you like talking about like in the flow. So give me a one sentence definition of that. For me? Yeah. Effortless. Like everything is just literally just happens. It just, there's no, it's just effortless for me. Like when I, when I describe flow to people, I'm like, when I'm in my flow state, things mm -hmm. are just happening without thought that it's just going like me. I'm trying to finish write a book right now okay. and there's, I'm not always in my flow state. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of my possible goals today. And I haven't actually done any editing yet because the book's done written, but I have to go back and I have to edit it. Edit, and yeah. uh, I haven't fallen into that flow state yet. So. I'm not forcing it. So where do you think the energy of that, like where do you think that comes from? Is that something you do to yourself to get you in that state? Some people have talked about that, right? For me, it just has to feel right at that point in time. That's why, like, like that's why I set a couple of goals this morning, but I didn't have to, they weren't hard coded at a certain time of day. But I also have learned that there's certain things that flow better for me in the morning than sure. better in the evening too. So there sure. is some of that and that, that I've learned just through self-discovery. Mm -hmm. For example, I am not going to write a book at 10 o'clock at night. Right. So there's no flow there. <laughs> yeah. yeah that's, the flow's not happening then. Well, I so. would add a word to your, to your description of alignment. Hmm. I think when you're aligned with yourself, whether you want to say your higher self or your spirit or just your core values, but when you really get into that space of alignment, then I think flow is, is a breath away. I like that. Yeah. 
That makes sense because like some people talk about how, oh, well, when, when everything gets aligned, the planets align, everything will happen. And, I don't know about the planets. Oh, yeah, exactly. I mean, again, this is just a hearsay. But I see the point of this alignment factor is that, okay, is the time of day fitting right? Is your energy at the right level? Uh, have you, for some people, have you eaten yet? Have you hydrated properly? Have you put all the necessary steps in place to allow that alignment to happen to engage that flow state? I do a visual where I picture the center of me kind of like a white beam of light and I'm and I pull all of my energy into that and just you know quantum physics is energy follows intent so mm -hmm. your energy will follow your intent so by just holding that intent for a moment kind of brings all of you back home usually you'll take a deep breath or a sigh and that lets you know you just you've kind of settled and you've kind of aligned yourself energetically and then from that space you can usually feel am I hungry am I tired like what do I need to step towards flow mm. I agree. Yeah, I, it's funny because we could talk about how people maybe are, I've tried necessarily forcing that alignment or forcing mm -hmm. that flow state and you can't. It doesn't actually yeah. work at all. You end up actually becoming more stressed out because it's not working. <laughs> well, and I, there's a phrase I love, uh, even though I'm not Christian, that a nun told me once when she came for a session and it was let go and let God. And hmm. she's like, sometimes when you feel like you're trying to force that alignment or force whatever, what if you did the opposite and you just turn the whole thing over and like to your spirit, to God, to whoever, you, you know, it is for you, but just like, okay, let, let the highest good prevail right now. And then things just kind of pop into your awareness. I'm like, oh, I know what I should do next. And it just kind of starts lining you up. Oh, I like that. Well, listen, since we're talking about these powerful keywords here, I got okay. to pop a little screen sharing in for the video watchers. So again, for the listeners, her okay. site actually is Christine Lang, your name, .org. But right on, the, right on the main homepage, um, mm -hmm. and your bio, by the way, the key words here are medical intuitive. Right. I, I really do want to dig into that because since we're talking about alignment right now and flow state, this mm -hmm. is all obviously uh, enveloped together, right? Right, right. So why medical intuitive? What, where, are we, what are we really trying well, to target with that? Okay, so I would say to just kind of break that down a little bit because, again, like 25 years ago, I wouldn't even know what a medical intuitive was. I don't even know if that description was out there. But an uh, I, I'm with you because I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> an intuitive is different from a psychic in that a psychic is usually about predicting the future. Hmm. So, so that's kind of the differentiation there, whereas an intuitive is saying, where are you right now? What's happening with you right now? You know, symptom-wise, physically, energetically, emotionally, mentally, where are you? So an intuitive is helping from that perspective. And then a medical intuitive brings in those physical symptoms. So when someone starts to talk to me about, oh, I have a hurt knee. And as they're talking about it, this kind of cone of energy opens up in front of them. And I start hearing information. I hear their spirit talking about it as well. And sometimes their spirit will be like, that's not true. He didn't hurt it two years ago. He hurt it two and a half years ago. You know, they start correcting. And I start getting information. So I don't just walk around looking at people all the time and, you know, violating their privacy by going, wow, that guy has the worst liver. He drinks all the time. <laughs> I don't do that. I always have to be invited in and then they have to steer me because people will say, oh, scan my body and tell me everything that's wrong. And then I'm like, oh, well, you know, that lump in your breast is nothing. They're like, lump in my breast, right? And they have a heart attack. So, so I really gear towards what people ask me about. And my job is to take your current level of awareness and expand it out. Hmm. So if you're like, well, I know that, you know, my stomach bothers me when I'm stressed. And my job is to go, okay, but it's actually one specific kind of stress. It's when you think you're not being a good husband. It's when you think this, this, and this is happening. Here's how you're internalizing that. You're replaying that message you heard as a child that you witnessed here, here, here. All of those pieces, when you connect those dots, and as soon as that symptom starts to speak to you, you can unpress the button. You can walk yourself back out of that, that trap. So it's about getting people to not only eliminate their symptom, but, but live much more peacefully and feel more, more harmonized and healed as well. So you're kind of aligning yourself with their energies to try and, again, I'm just trying to do a translation here, sure. uh, <laughs> to, to help them self-discover the triggers that lead to the symptoms, that lead them to these possibly right. chronic conditions or chronic pains. Uh, I think the key word here is chronic because a lot of people think that these chronic conditions are not necessarily, and pardon the term, curable. And right. I like to use the term reversible, right? Because it's just like in modern medicine. I gotta, we're not MDs, right? And not that MD right. means you know everything because I've already right. proven that they don't. So I know about more nutrition than most MDs. So the, sure. <laughs> it drives me crazy when it's like, oh, well, my MD, I'll, I'll go check out my MD. I'm like, your MD's not going to tell you anything because they don't know. Right. It's, right. All guess, it's all guesswork. So uh, I tell, uh, actually a good friend of mine, they're, they're, they're actually doctors, but uh, they, they actually created a great quote. And they said, we all need to become 
our own inner physicians. Mm -hmm. I agree. Absolutely. That's that self-discovery component, learning more about you and what right. your lifestyle is and what triggers are happening and affecting that. Like back to your point on, because I, I geek out about gut biome and gut bacteria and cortisol levels. And it's like, guys, right. like your stress levels are cortisol levels and the cortisol levels affect your gut biology and affects so many other things. It's like, but again, if I went back five, 10 years ago, I wouldn't know what I was talking about. But, but, and I'm going to come in that step earlier, which is, what are the thoughts and emotions and old triggers for you that, re- that trigger your body to release cortisone that sets off that cascade that you know about? Good right? point. For me, it's coming in at that core level. So like for my allergies, for example. So what I discovered over, is that your dog? Yeah, you hear him? <laughs> See, I, I used to freak out about that, ladies and gentlemen. You might hear Calvin the coon hound. Uh, we it saved Calvin from cancer uh, this past month. So we're very, I'm very excited to hear Aww. him get very excited when a package gets dropped off on our front porch. So oh, well, he probably he, orders a lot from Amazon and this is exciting for him. He is a very active online <laughs> shopper. Uh, he does feel he doesn't have enough toys. I keep telling him I he know. has an unhealthy obsession. Uh, <laughs> ergo my fiance. So <laughs> but yes, he likes to say hi to delivery people by howling like crazy. So he's a, <laughs> he's an English coon hound. So he, so he has a big mouth. He does, yeah. <laughs> but so in regards to my allergies, what, you know, it, I discovered was that the the mental emotional stuff and the reason they started in law school was because it's when I'm being way too hard on myself and when I'm putting these impossible standards on myself, which was easy to do in law school because I went to a, a top law school. So the kid to the right of me was from Harvard and the girl on the left of me was from Yale. And I'm like, oh, great. You know, <laughs> that the stress factor on that and, you know, these people are all in the bathroom throwing up and making themselves sick from stress and anxiety. And just the whole culture there was so intense. And again, we go back to the, like bragging rights, like look at what we're all enduring. And my allergies came up as a way of my spirit trying to point out to me the negative self-talk I had of just like whipping myself into a frenzy to keep the adrenaline high so I would stay super focused and keep my nose to the grindstone. So at the end of that whole journey, not only did I learn to hear my spirit and my client's spirit and learn all this stuff, my allergies were gone, but so was the way I used to talk to myself. So it was this, it's not just healing the allergies, it's that transformation of self too, where you heal those negative triggers, you heal the inaccurate beliefs you have about what you're worth and what your value is in the world. And, and so all of that goes together. I, I love where we're going with this because obviously thanks to Calvin saying hi in the background and he hardly ever actually shows up on the mic. Usually it's just you and I hearing him and then the listeners don't get to hear him. I used to hide it. Now I'm like, no, I want them to hear Calvin. Cause right. Cal- Calvin, was, <laughs> well, Calvin was supposed to die two months ago and, and we saved him. But I, what you're talking about here, let's be real, this energy, this flow, right? this uh, will go into intuitive uh, awareness. Like I remember when Calvin was, we, we found out he had cancer. Uh-huh. Um, I was like my fiance, she's an equine horse vet doctor. She studied at Cornell and UPenn and she's a doctor of chiropractic as well for animals. So, but when it comes to our dog, everything goes right yeah. out the window. Exactly. You turn into a puddle. <laughs> her stress levels are through the roof. Her cortisol is through the roof. Like she's right. basically lying on him crying every night. And I'm like, <laughs> baby, I was like, you're, you're giving him the wrong energy. Yeah. We, we need to maybe become dog whispers and pardon the connection here. And, yeah. and I was like, I, I had forced myself to always be positive around him and always be cheerful around him and try and battle the energy that she was giving off. I was like, babe, I was like, you need to keep the a constant positive mindset. I was like, you know, we're going to do what medicine can do, mm-hmm. but if he's going to get through this, he needs us to get through it with him. And right. I'm just intrigued to hear if you've ever really... Well, I- and part of what I understand is that animals come to serve us. And part of how most animals serve us is by thinking they protect us, not just from that nasty UPS driver for Amazon, but also protect us energetically. And so they tend to mirror a lot of what we're feeling. Some animals go so far as to take on the symptoms of their owners. I've had Thank you. dogs and cats, you know, get get stomach issues because their their owner has stomach issues and isn't dealing with it. And so now the dog's puking because the person has the stomach issues and isn't taking care of themselves. But they'll take that dog to the vet, but they won't take themselves to the doctor, right? So, so animals will serve us in whatever way they think they can best serve us. So if, if your fiance, no offense to her, but if she's lying on him crying, he's likely to think, okay, I've, I've got to send her some heart energy to cheer That's her up. That's what I told her. I was like, right then, right? he needs it, his energy to get well. 
if she and I are ever having a bad day, you want to call it a bad day, trust me, where's Calvin? Calvin will get up on the couch, burrow up next to her and be there and absorb that. And he, cause he's, he's, I actually believe maybe not all dogs, but at least him, a lot of dogs to, are just like, not just a companion, they're a healer. They're trying to pull that bad energy out of you and make you happy. That's why I told her, I was like, he does it all the time for you. Right now, you got to do that for him. I was yeah, like, we got to reverse this energy. So, Yeah, I think animals are a one way for us to learn how to love and they make it seem safer because they're not going to say, really, you're going to wear that shirt out, right? <laughs> they're not going to say anything that's going to make us feel rejected. And most of us are so you know worried about feeling rejected. So we feel safer letting ourselves be loved by our animals. So it is, they come in as these kind of love coaches, right? To help you practice being, being better at giving and receiving love. Hmm. So translating all that back, obviously the mankind, okay. <laughs> you know, you know, I, I just, you know, I love, we love the canine world where we don't yeah. have kids. So Calvin, I, I actually, I, I mentioned this on one of my holiday episodes where I, I went solo for the holidays on a couple episodes, which I normally don't do. And I was reflecting on this process and going through investing a lot of money into him, <laughs> but also the, the energy drain from that. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize, sure. I, I, I started realizing, wow, I was drained trying to be there for her and him, and I didn't realize it. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought, well, I'm more self-aware than most these days, and right. I still was missing, it was going right over me. Well, yeah. and most people don't recognize how much fear is an energy drain. Mm. Right. You can think of it as fe fear is feeding energy to a future you don't want. Good point. So I like that. Say that again. Our right, listeners, you got write this okay. down. Hit pause. She's <laughs> going to drop a bomb on you again. Please say that again. Okay. So fear is investing some of your energy in the future you don't want. Wow. I love that. That's profound. So it's you're leaking energy, and if you believe it at all that thoughts create or you know law of attraction, any of that kind of stuff, now you're you're making more likely something that you hope doesn't happen. So you're working against yourself. Now, and do you yeah, find that's common with most people you work with? Is a oh, lot yeah. of fear. I mean, if you're a human, you're going to have fears mm -hmm. because it's also part of the amygdala, the primitive part of our brain. That brain keeps keeps us alive by having that guard function like don't step out in front of the bus don't do this don't touch the hot burner so on physical things that part of the brain works great your and your ego is in charge of that as well your ego interprets that and says mm -hmm. don't touch that don't do that on emotional things it does a crappy job right so so the first guy that i ever dated who broke up with me wore gray flannel cologne to this day i can walk past a guy and he's wearing gray flannel I'm like i don't like that guy well, hello. That's a, wow. <laughs> Emotionally hard-coded. That's hard -coded. a lizard brain acting like a lizard, right? That's my ego misinterpreting saying one plus one equals a potato, right? Mm. And it doesn't make any sense. But so we have to learn to differentiate between things that, you know, our, our mind is actively keeping us from getting hurt on a physical level and all the stuff like worrying about your dog, worrying about your fiance, that's all on mental and emotional fears. And there's, there's so little chance that that part of your brain is actually helpful in the, those worries are going to do anything productive. Interesting. So I love how we brought up the amygdala, the lizard brain concept, the fight or flight, mm -hmm. uh, this mm -hmm. in so many different ways. Uh, have you ever heard of uh, the, she's a best-selling author and speaker, Mel Robbins. Sure. Mm -hmm. The five second rule. Mm -hmm. I have her book, digital and physical. And I love bringing that up when we talk about stuff like this, because that's like a, a classic way to battle our natural protective uh, lizard brain. That's what for, for newer listeners who don't understand that, it, that is that fight or flight component. It's you're just deep seated, hard coded down to the genetic level going thousands of years back. Like that's just what we do. We, we want to protect right. each other. It's like your instantaneous response is safety mode. But if right. you can wait five seconds, you know, sometimes it's only two or three, but you're just allowing a few seconds for you to get yeah. through that transition. Things become more clear. You can, even, you can even speed that up a little more. Not that it shouldn't wait five seconds, but sometimes when I'm aware, that's the part of my brain that I'm thinking with. Mm -hmm. I will picture my forehead as a way, uh, in my mind's eyes, a way of pulling energy there faster to start processing from a higher portion of the brain. You said you picture your forehead as in the third yeah, eye? Like or... your, that part of your brain, because your prefrontal cortex is like the opposite of the lizard brain, right? That's the brain right. evolved back front, right? So, so if I want, like, if I'm aware, okay, I'm processing this from that... <gasps> I don't want to talk to that guy. 
he smells like rain, blah, 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 he's gonna hurt my feelings, he's gonna whatever. Then in addition to waiting five seconds, I also in my mind's eye just like picture, okay, I wanna process this from up here, from mm -hmm. the forehead area. And that also just, just moving your energy forward like that, usually you'll exhale a little more and you'll be like, okay, I got this. Because it again, turns off that fight or flight mechanism, turns off the, your, abil your, your way of evaluating it as either, it's gonna kill me, or I'm going to run away, right? <laughs> I don't want those to be the two options. <laughs> so I'm interested to make another connection here. So obviously, again, your site, again, ladies and gentlemen, christinelang.org. Again, this will all be linked in the show notes like we always do. But uh, the medical intuitive, and we've talked a lot about medical symptoms, and I don't want to get away from that, but and you've also, but you've also tied into a lot on emotion. And so something I just did recently because I'm about to get married for the first time and hopefully the only time <laughs> um, is I finally listened to a few other influencers that were on the show and I finally went back and I read the classic, uh, the five love languages. Okay. And okay. Okay. I'm sure you probably have heard of that. Sure. Sure. And, if, and I, and now I made my fiance do the same. Um, mm -hmm. She doesn't really enjoy the book because she, she's so logical. She's a very smart right, girl. Right. And the, uh, she, she listens to audiobooks like I do. So uh -huh. unfortunately, whoever they hired to do the voiceover, the guy sounds he's from the South and he's straight out of a church and he oh, wow. comes across as like a Southern preacher while he's talking the book. So it's, that's the wrong <laughs> kind of thing. resisting the information as it's coming uh, in. Yeah. Well, because, okay, we, we went through and I found out that I, I like words of affirmation. Apparently, that's one of my top things. Right. And the reason why I went through this is because over the past few years of our relationship, whenever we got frustrated with each other, or especially me getting frustrated with her, I always would say, you know, you're not hearing me, or you don't appreciate what I do. And I was like, I always knew that there was this, we, we don't understand how to communicate better. And that's why right. I'm, like, I'm, a, I'm Mr. Self-help, professional help guy. Like, dude, what can I do to hack this? Like, where right. am I going to go? Right. What do I got to read? <laughs> and so I love the book and I made her and a good friends of mine. I found out once I told them I did it, they're like, oh, we did that years ago. We love it. So all, this, all these people I find out have done this. Yeah. And it's like, oh, I'm late to the party. <laughs> I'm totally late to the party. So I had her do the test. Uh -huh. just in, and my, my good friend, she said, listen, have Kristen do the test. Don't force the book on her. Let her do the yeah. test. Show her how you came out and how she came out. And even though you already read the book, back off. Right. You guys share the same audible library. <laughs> Let her start listening to the book. And she is. Uh, uh -huh. She has to get past the voiceover guy because every time she hears things like, well, if you're the kind of person who uh, likes acts of service, which she does, that's one of hers. Um, and, and the guy in the book's like, you know, for example, it's, if your husband, maybe your husband likes acts of service, meaning, you know, he wants you to make him dinner. <laughs> she hears that. <laughs> that's her off. She's like, I'm not a woman. And plus I cook way better than her. So I was like, you have nothing to worry about. I was like, I love cooking for you. So <laughs> anyway, I was wondering with this, everything we're discussing, how, how do you tie all that together? Because isn't that part of this too? There's a lot of emotional energy tied to language and this Absolutely. whole significant other in relationships. Well, and if you think of like how you're, how you, where you tend to get physical symptoms. So, and, and we're not talking injuries like sports injuries because no. that's going to be related more Maybe to the a sport, stomach right? ache or. But yeah, if you get certain, if, if you think you have like a weak area of the body, that usually clues you in on how you store stress which clues you in on some of these same kind of ideas. So let's say you're somebody who gets, when you get stressed, you get a stomach ache. Mm -hmm. So that tells me you relate that where we store stress in our stomach tends to be the people who relate to their stress in terms of how they've screwed up. Mm -hmm. Things are a reflection on them. Okay. So it's, so your stomach is where you store stress. That's about how you see yourself and how you think other people see you, which can be very different, right? Versus somebody who, who gets, um, you know, a lot of like, if they're a woman, they might get a lot of female issues or a guy might get a lot of bowel issues or low back pain. If you Ooh, I, 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 I'm coming off of a back injury. So, oh, well, <laughs> so if you store I just had your a rib put back in place yesterday, oh, so. God, that's different. Okay. But if you store <laughs> your energy in, you know, your stress in that lower part of the abdomen, low back area, that means you relate to things in terms of power. Is somebody mm. taking my power? They give me power. Am I feeling disempowered about money, about sex, about relationships, about my career? When we feel disempowered, that tends to be where we store stress. And, yeah. How, and do you ever hear about this stuff manifesting into uh, sleep performance as well? I've heard of it. I haven't read any of the books. Like or, maybe people who don't sleep deep, things like that, right? Because you, you're carrying right. that stuff into your, you know, late night sleep cycle. For example, right. you haven't dealt with some of this stuff. Right. And 
And so if you store a lot of stress in a certain area of your body, it's going to become a weak area of the body because you've got all this negative energy stored there. Versus somebody who maybe stores a lot of stress in their throat. They're always clearing their throat. Every time they get a cold, they lose their voice. You know, they, they get a lot of neck stuff, mouth and gum disease, that kind of stuff. That tells me they store stress in terms of, are they really allowed to speak their truth or do people shut them down or make them wrong for it? Interesting. So a boss can walk into an office, scream and just lose his cookies and have a meltdown. And, you know, Martha gets a stomach ache, Bob gets a headache. This person gets a sore throat and their, you know, their shoulders are up to their ears. Everybody internalizes that stress differently depending on the lens they see the world through and how they internalize stress in their body. And one of the triggers was the leader in that office passing all that negative energy into that room. Right. But if he walks in and screams, you know, it's a sales team and you guys just aren't performing and this company's going to go down, it's going to be all your fault and you people suck, right? So he just does this general bellowing. How each person even hears that is going to be about where their kind of their weak links in their armor are, right? So, so, and how, so just a little bit that you've shared about you and your fiance, I would say, given that she likes acts of service and she also just feels to me very kinesthetic as a learner, whereas Mm. you're an audio learner. And, and so you want words of affirmation. She wants acts of service. So we tend to love in the way that we want to be loved. Right. So you're like saying all the right things to her. They're going totally over her head. You're getting no credit for that. (laughs) And, and she's wanting to do the right thing, like reach out and touch your arm. And you're like, don't even touch me. So you said the right thing. Right. So you're, you're in this loop of not being able to connect communicate because you're not addressing each other's weak spot or fear hole that the you know argument threw you into wow That's so then you're going to be likely to get symptoms that are related to that not that your ears are going to start hurting but if you internalize it as i would guess you're going to be more likely to internalize something as a in your stomach area and she's going to be more likely to internalize it lower in her abdomen or back because it's going to relate more to power versus am i really being heard you know, she does love the foam roller that I gave her. That girl is on the living room floor like every day, <laughs> foam rolling her back all the time. Um, there could be. So, some- what did she say was her number one um, love language? So, her number one is acts of acts of uh, service. Service. Okay. Right. What was and her number two? Her number two. Well, my number two was of all things. I was surprised. My number two and number three uh, were tied. So, I just I'm kind of okay. like trying to see if I can balance them. And actually, I took a photo just because I'm still trying to memorize them all. So uh, I'm words of affirmation. I scored off the charts on that. And okay. then my, my, my runner-ups were tied between quality time and physical touch. And okay. then hers was acts of service. And then her clear number two was quality time. So, okay. so well, we get so tied, I, I we're tied say, on quality time. So. Okay. Well, and I would say quality time in, in – touch the reason i think they probably tied for you is because what you're really wanting is to feel somebody energetically connected to you yes i do agree that's more likely to happen through physical touch than just quality time like in other words if you you know do some shopping together like hey let's go to the grocery store and let's do it together because we haven't spent much time together this week so you that can count in some ways as quality time but if when she's trying to decide what, what kind of butter to buy. And she turns and looks at you and, sa- and says something and you lock eyes and you're just like, yeah, I really want to hear about this for you. <laughs> that, then it just became quality time, right? And you're, you're talking about something. You're like, you know what? That reminds me of this phone call I had today. Can I tell you about it? And she stops the car and turns around and goes, tell me right now. And you, and you anchor into that moment. That's what makes it count. Whether she's touching you at that point or not, it's like, okay, are, am I energetically connected to you where you have my full attention? Yeah. That's interesting. I, 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 Again, it's it's cool to go through these exercises because some people hearing all the stuff that we're talking about right now, they're like, five love languages and, <laughs> and listening and what's this all about? I'm like, uh, again, I geek out on this stuff because this is, I truly believe this is what, people don't take enough responsibility. I have no problem saying it, it's my show. We as people do not take enough responsibility for what could be possibly going on in our lives or around our lives. I don't know, how would you like to weigh in on that? Right, and, well, and I think people... I do a lot of work with couples and um, they, cause I can channel both their spirits. So they'll say, you know, I'll say, what do you think this argument or issues is about? And they each give their sides and then their spirits come in and go, no, here's what they're really arguing about. And of course that's like dead on. And, but so I would say that most, most couples say, Oh, we just don't, we need to learn to communicate better. Hmm. What they're really saying is she, he needs to hear me better. 
Yes. That I need to speak more clearly, right? It, the communication means I'm not, I'm talking and talking, but I don't feel like I'm being heard. Again, they're hearing through that filter. You know, we're not hearing to learn about the other person. We're hearing to prove ourselves right or wrong. That's a good point. Wow. I'm loving this. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, yeah, it's, this is all valid stuff. And I think people have never really thought about it in your domain, right? right? So you found a way. So here's the thing, like what if somebody's hearing all this stuff and they, and they, they go to your site and they're like, so all she's doing is she's one of these weirdos. Uh, I'm just having fun with this, by the way. But it's right. like, like one of these weirdos that I've seen where like these psychics, right? They're just right. asking you, they just learn to ask these right questions to get the right answers. And then they don't, I was like, well then why is that a bad thing? Well, let's say, let's right. say that's all true. Yeah, let's say you I'm found, just like, you I'm found just somebody. good at observing and asking the right questions. Yeah. If you come out of the session understanding yourself and your significant other better, who cares? I don't care if I just like, you know, patted you on the head for an hour. Does it really yeah, matter? You, you can right? look at it from a psychologist to a psychology to, to right. obviously whispering to, to uh, counselors. I, uh, my thing is, if somebody has found the right probing questions right. to help you self-discover the right answers, and then you come out of that knowing more about yourself and or your significant other mm -hmm. and things progress in a more positive path. When? <laughs> well, so, yeah, I love the saying like science doesn't care if you believe it or not. It still works on you. Mm. Well, but again, in your situation, what's going through my mind right now is that might've been great. That one counseling session, right? But like there's, mm -hmm. there's a lot of people, <laughs> they now wear it like a badge of honor. People and I know out of New York city or LA they're like, Oh, mm -hmm. you don't have a, a what do they call it now? Not a counselor, but uh, everybody's, what's that? Therapy, yeah, there you Everybody's, oh yeah, like, you don't have a therapist? I've got a, I've had a therapist for years. I love my therapist. And right. Like, Therefore, I'm a more together person because I already have one in my back pocket, right? <laughs> I was like, I'm sorry, I don't have a regular therapist because I'm great at self-critiquing myself and I have a podcast show and I meet awesome people like you. So I almost feel like I'm going through like mini pulses of therapy because I, I get to self-analyze myself. Absolutely, but it, it's all about, I mean, the more you increase your self-awareness, you'll naturally make the higher choice. Hmm. I like that. Ooh. Nobody wakes up and says, I want to be a jerk today, right? I mean, everybody makes their choice based on the options they can see. And the, the guy that, you know, goes and robs somebody's house, it's because he woke up that day and he's like, I don't eat or I rob somebody's house. You know, you and I see the other options or go get a job or go get, you go to a homeless right. shelter, do these different things. He doesn't see those options or he would take them. Everybody makes the highest choice from the options they see. So when somebody comes in for a session and they're like, well, I'm either going to have to quit my job and then be, you know, really struggling for money, or I've got to continue to take this abuse from my boss. They see those two options and their spirit says, oh, here's options three, four, and five. Yeah. And, and so to me, the best therapist in the world for you is your own spirit. He's been with you since day one. He knows the way you're thinking and the lens you're seeing the world through. And he's just going to start opening up those options for you. Well, what, again, what I'm hearing from you also is that, Again, but to my point is you can go to the counselor, you can go to the therapist, but you have to keep going over and over again. And mm -hmm. the reason why is because you're looking to build consistency or sustainability. So I think from people possibly meeting with you, and I've not met with you before until today, is that you're trying to teach people that the awareness around your energy and your flow, so to speak, because right. that is the self-awareness you need to understand so you can yeah. build a sustainable result. I would love to put myself out of business. I always say like my goal is put myself out of business because I introduce everybody to the best therapist for them, which is their spirit. And the, the new online class I made was because people are saying, okay, I'd like to have a session with you every day. Can't afford it. So here's this, you know, one class and there's all these videos on the, on that class where you, you can find ways to ask your spirit questions and get answers. Now and, it, and is that people your come like, I've done that spirit? video five times, right? <laughs> is that your course to communicate with your spirit? I'm going to go back to screen sharing. Yeah. Again. Yeah. Um, it just launched out January 1st, actually. And I've already had people saying, oh my gosh, the, the video where you get to ask your spirit for help with a problem in our relationship, I've already used it five times, right? And I get a different answer to different things. And so that, the idea of like getting people to be able to connect to their spirit on their own, so you don't need me, you know, that's, that's part of my goal is to wean people off of me channeling for them. And, and sometimes clients will call and say, okay, I sat in meditation and I saw a papaya. What the heck does that mean? I'm like, oh, there's a digestive enzyme in papaya that's in nothing else. Your spirit's telling you you need these digestive enzymes. So Whoa. people might okay. need it, help it, getting the interpretation. It blew my mind right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was not expecting you to go to that level on that one. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Uh, I think, you know, I have a lot of, because I've been doing this for so long and teaching the classes and the, 
at class that's online that I've been teaching versions of it in person. And I've taught thousands of people how to connect to their spirit. And people will call me and go, okay, I don't, I couldn't figure out like why my sister was frustrating me so much. I sat in meditation, I connected to my spirit and she showed me a scene from a movie and I realized I was being the guy. I was being that guy in that scene and I knew exactly what to say. I knew how my sister felt. So your spirit doesn't have to come in like, you know, some Moses figure and say, here's what to say, here's what to do. It's just about increasing your awareness and you'll make the love-based choice. You'll make that higher choice from your heart because this is about people you care about. Well, I, I'm definitely aligning what you're talking about because, like, I mean, like my father has gotten back into more of his, re, you know, religious roots now. So whenever mm-hmm. like amazing things happen, or I, I I miss a really bad thing that happened, maybe nearby a bad car crash, whatever. My dad always, right. oh, he's like, I'm telling you, you have a great guiding angel, guiding spirit. Listen, whatever you want to call it. Right. I I also believe that I, I sometimes I use like, hey man, I just I I trust in my gut. Right. Something didn't feel right. I made yeah. it. This happened a month ago, actually. I was, I, I, by 30 minutes, I missed, I missed this death, deadly crash on the highway. I just happened to say, you know what? I'm not going to take that way home because I went through that earlier and I didn't like the way it looked because it was a construction zone. Right. And then sure enough, an 18 wheeler came through that construction zone, never stopped. And, and doesn't everybody have a story where they're like, you know, my gut told me, whether they said my gut told me, my yeah. guardian angel told me, whatever. Everybody has those moments. And that's what I'm saying. It's like dialing that knob. So if everybody has intuition, if you're alive, you have, in, you have intuition because intuition is really just hearing a message from your spirit. Mm-hmm. And so everybody has intuition. And then whether it's my course or certain books or whatever, those are just turning up that volume knob. And so- it always makes your life better. We've been having such a great episode, but I have no problem getting more uh, connected to you. Like, is there some small examples that people hearing this, like you could do it to me or I do it to me or whatever, but it's like, there's some small (laughs) examples that to help people understand how, what you're talking about, like what we're talking about, being more connected to your inner voice, so to speak. Okay. So let's, let's just say you, you have a chronic symptom and you're wondering, well, like, well, what's the message underneath it? What's my, what the hell's my spirit trying to tell me with this, you know, back pain, headache, whatever. So I always, you know, invite people, you don't have to be a student of meditation, you don't have to know any of that, but if you just sit and get quiet, and by that I mean make, make the sound actually quiet, soft music or no sound, and then just every thought that comes into your head, just label it a thought. That's a thought, and picture releasing it, picture releasing it, you know, out in the breeze. And you do that for three or four minutes, you don't stop producing thoughts because it's not going to happen. If you're alive, you're producing thoughts, but you'll start slowing down. Hmm. When you start slowing down and you notice that little drop, You'll, find, you'll feel that little drop, either your, your heart rate and your blood pressure will lower, you'll, you'll breathe a little deeper. When you, and that may take two minutes or may take five minutes. But after a few minutes, when you're just releasing thoughts, releasing thoughts, you're gonna quiet. And then in your mind's eye, like go to that part of your body, just like close your eyes and imagine going to your stomach, to your you know, ears, whatever's bothering you. Wherever that symptom and, is. Yeah, thanks, wherever that symptom is. And then just say, what are you trying to tell me? And people always go, that is not gonna work. And then they come back and go, oh my God, I. I got it. It relates to the argument I had with my brother last week. And they might not have all the answers, but they've got a starting point. Hmm. And it's, you know, people are surprised at how well that works. But that just that process of acknowledging that your symptoms might not just be a pain in the butt, that they might actually be something that could help you or give you be a roadmap of sorts. And then honoring it by going in and just like going, all right, what are you trying to tell me? No, I, I, I just, I'm, in my brain, as you're telling me this, I'm thinking back to, like when my fiance, <laughs> I don't know I've said this on the show because I don't care. Uh, she broke, <laughs> she broke up with me uh, because uh, I've said it many times that my head was very far up my butt. Um, <laughs> but I spent years being a bachelor and former firefighter and blah, 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 tough guy. And figured like I was invincible. And right. she, she still to this day uses terms like, did nobody train you? <laughs> Were you raised by goats? Yeah. yeah. So uh, anyway, so I, I did raise goats as a kid, but uh, yeah. <laughs> well, there you go. So I, w- I would joke around, but then I, the, the dating, you know, barely lasted a, uh, the first year, and and she broke up with me, and I was, you know, already in my mid thirties, and I think something clicked, and I was like, wait a minute, I still remember this. I was like, I just was calm enough. I was, I was definitely distraught about it. I was surprised I was distraught about it because I was Mr. I don't need anybody. I've been single my whole life, right. blah, blah, blah. But something clicked differently than I ever did before. And I allowed myself to kind of pay attention to it. And I said, well, is it her or is it me? 
or is it both of us? But I was like, I, I, I made myself self-reflect. Mm-hmm. And that, and the biggest epiphany that came out of it, there's a lot of epiphanies that came out of it, right. <laughs> but you'll appreciate it was, I was like, dude, did you actually, like something inside of me is like, did you actually let her in? You know, the mm-hmm. whole thing about virtual walls being right. up and everything else. Right. Did, and then, then the, here was the, here was the last thing that went in my head. Did you not just let her, let her in, but did you even give her a chance? And that was like, boom, like a mind yeah. explosion went off. And I was like, Oh shit. (laughs) Oh crap. It was all on my turn. Yeah. I was like, uh, okay. I got some work to do. (laughs) Yeah. And and I spent the next three months doing self-discovery work and I'm online doing, you know, video courses like you have for understanding Mm -hmm. love and and getting vulnerable and embracing and allowing the walls and learning that actually getting vulnerable actually shows strength. Um, you know, all this stuff. So. Okay, cause so I, I, I know you didn't ask, but can I like tell you something I'm hearing your spirit say while you're telling, telling me that? I, I, yeah, go for okay, it. Okay, okay. What he said was that when you, when you first met her and you'd had the success you'd had in the physical world, being the firefighter, the workout guy, all that stuff, that he said it lent to a type of mental and emotional rigidity hmm. where you didn't feel you had to bend much because might makes right. Like I, I've already proven that I'm doing things right. So I don't have to be that open to hearing alternative like viewpoints or whatever. And I think you gave them lip service, but I don't think you really absorbed and listened to learn. I think you probably listened to disprove. And so it also kept you from being vulnerable. Oh yeah. And, and so when, when she broke up with you, you felt the vulnerability of being rejected. And then it's like, well, here I was trying to protect myself from something I never did. So your spirit said, then you recognize the rigidity worked against you. And all that three months of self-help stuff was about trying to dismantle the rigidity. It's like taking apart a coral yes. reef, right? You're just trying to take apart that rigidity. And your spirit said, then the more you did it, the more you liked the softening in you because you liked how it felt to interact in the world with that softness, not just with her. So then you started seeing it as like, okay, even if I don't get back with her, this just feels better to be in the world this way because taking away that kind of coral reef in front of my heart and dismantling some of that rigidity, more stuff comes in as well as more stuff goes out from my heart chakra and it actually just feels good. Then it became something you were doing, not just to win her back, but for you. Mm -hmm. And that's when it felt authentic and that's why she would get back. Well, it's interesting because then the other quote that popped into my head when we were going through that was, I had, I thought I did a lot of self-discovery work and it was, and I'm interested to see how you, see my spirit saying this, but I was, I was like, okay, I've, I've done all this stuff, right? I grew up as a farm kid, then made myself go to school and work my way up in a corporate world without a degree. And then go, I made myself go back to school, get the degree. Like I kept going for these wins, 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 right. then left it all behind, became a firefighter. That's what the new book's going to be about. And I served as a wild and firefighter out West. And like, literally it was my buddy did the research and he said, I was the third or fourth uh, most dangerous job in the world. I had no idea. I just, right. it looked like an adventure and I was going for it. <laughs> um, all those things happen. And during that transition, I, I just told you about, I also realized the other thing that popped in my head was, you know, you've taken all these risks and here was the, here's the epiphany. It still gets my, uh, my hair to come up with my arm is, but you've never risked your heart. Yes. Like truly, truly risked your heart. Like I've dated, I haven't broken up with before, but I was like, did you truly risk yeah. your heart? And okay. you've done all the other risks. <laughs> so here, so first of all, did what did I say last time resonate? Oh yeah, because okay. actually, as you were saying that, my hair was already standing okay. up on my head too. So, so then I'm going to continue because you're. So here's what your spirit just said about what you just said. He said that you, by growing up on a farm and and everything, part of how you learn to like deal with death and the the hardships of of being on a farm and around is by learning to kind of harden your heart. And he said your dad kind of told you like being a man is about kind of shutting down your heart. And so then taking those risks on the physical level, adrenaline, for people who have their heart shut down like that, and they can happen for a million different reasons, adrenaline substitutes for emotion. Oh, I definitely increased okay. my level of adrenaline junkie as I got older. Right. Like I'm, right. I'm a self-proclaimed adrenaline wanting, junkie. Well, you're wanting to feel more and more emotionally, but since you don't know how to do it, you go for more and more adrenaline. Totally valid. Okay. <laughs> totally so, <yeah>. valid. <laughs> So your spirit said that when you, when you met your fiance and had the relationship with her, you actually started feeling emotionally, but it's like it trickled in, right? Mm -hmm. So it trickles in. And then when that's gone, there's no amount of adrenaline 
it's going to substitute for that because now you've built the real deal. Mm. So then you had to figure out how to get how to connect to that to get that feeling back. There's up on the arm. There's, <laughs> there's a goosebumps. Right? <laughs> so your spirit says that that that's a different way of understanding. Is it. like, oh, I recognize I wanted to live more on the emotional level, not just on the physical level. Mm. No, it took like 30, 40 years. <laughs> hey, you know what? The people in their 70s and 80s just figuring that out. You're doing fine. Really? Wow. Yeah, yeah. Well, people who, like, I have men come see me and they're like, okay, I, I lived out in LA for 10 years and had a practice out there and I did a bi coastal practice for a while. And, it, and they would say, okay, I'm, I'm in the movie industry. I make $5 million a year. And I got to kind of think this is all there is. Same thing. They've had to shut down their heart and now they've had all the success in the material world and they're like, and I feel kind of flat. Yeah. And so it's, they think it's time to get on their spiritual path. And, yeah, I don't care what word you put to it. Really. It's just about learning how to feel emotionally and dismantle whatever walls they've got up so that they can actually acknowledge what they're feeling and begin to heal it. So they feel safe enough to go out into the world this way on that emotional level. Well, and there's a lot of very financially successful people who are still are, are heavily struggle with that because they're also afraid of, are the people connecting with me for the money, for the success, or are they truly, right. am, you know, right. and I, I, that's a, that's a whole different ball of wax. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But now yeah. you value transparency and I'm going to give your, your fiance some credit for this because you value transparency because you recognize, oh, the vulnerability actually feels good. Well, when you're a firefighter, vulnerability feels like threatening. So you had to do a 180 from who you used to be to who you are now in order to reconnect with Oh, it, it was hard. I mean, yeah, the, sure. the firefighting inspired Live the Fuel. That's where the fire and the logo came okay. from. And because that was such a transformative experience. Mm -hmm. And I have a lot of successes to share in the book that I'm finishing, but I'm also making sure that I, I make sure that I am balancing that with the risks, the the personal risks you take to take that it's, I, I respect people who have chosen to do that for their career and for their right. life, because there's more than just sacrificing the hours in the day or your life on the fire line. There's so many other ancillary things that I learned in just that two year experience, I, I, observing how people had riskier relationships or there mm -hmm. was, you know, they were risk not, not willing to get too much in love or they were overly in love and they were worried about people cheating on them. And it was like, there's all this mental game stuff. Right. And I observed and I'm like, my God, that, that's why I stayed single the whole time. Cause I was like, well, because to be proficient in something like that kind of work, you have to operate primarily on the physical and mental level. Yeah. And the belief system is there isn't room for the emotional level. That, exactly. Nailed it. That's what I, that's exactly the way my brain was wired. I yeah. was like, don't let all these other distractions in. Cause you need, I, you know, I committed to do one of the hardest jobs I'm going for it. And right. I'm not allowing this other stuff to distract me. And I have clients who are ER doctors who, you know, other kinds of things where it's the same thing, like I can't afford to get emotional. And mm. this one woman came to me and, and was an ER doctor and said that. And I said, I'm going to, I'm going to just show you that if you can actually learn to work through your intuition and gut, you're going to be a better doctor. And her success rate is incredible. Like some kid will come in and you know, everybody's jumping all around trying to do stuff. And she's like, I can feel the test he needs. And she just goes from her intuition and she's actually more skillful as a doctor, but boy, that took years to unprogram that stuff that, that you're taught, you know, in these risky jobs. I mean, I could see, I, I'm tying this all together. I could see what you do benefiting that medical profession as well, because I, from dating my fiance now, now engaged, obviously, but mm -hmm. from dating her, I learned, I, I knew that veterinarians go through a lot, right? but I had no idea they were actually ranked in the top 10, if not top five, like highest suicide rate professions mm -hmm. next to like Dennis, which is, that's just weird to right. me too. But, yeah. uh, I was like, but, uh, but I was like, really? And she said, yeah, because they deal with life and death situations day in and day out. And that's so exhausting. So to your point, they're turning off all these other things and they just allow that, all that, I don't want to say it's always negative energy, but the, no, when, they have, when they have to take a life, you know, someone's loved one. I mean, in my, in my case, my fiance, she, when she puts down someone's horse, uh, it's a heavy toll on her. Oh and, yeah. Well, and I think it's not even just the, the intensity of the life or death around the horse. I would say the biggest drain for veterinarians is the fear-based energy that they have to feel from the, from the owner. And yes. if, you know, if your fiance is sitting there and, and she's trying to use her intuition, like, okay, this horse can't tell me what's wrong. I've got to figure this out. So she's using her brain obviously to figure things out, but she's also using her intuition about what she can feel is going on. Well, she has to, she has to do all that through the gray cloud of fear and anxiety that is coming off that owner. And it is muddying the waters. 
Yes. And so that's, that's the bigger drain on vets. I mean, of course, they care about animals and, and seeing one be sick or hurt certainly stresses them, but it's nothing compared to the stress of these hysterical owners who are, you know, grief stricken or terrified that something's going to happen. And oh God, yeah. I have a client who's a vet who's like, oh my God, this woman is pulling on my arm screaming, save him, save him. And I'm like, if you let go of me, I could, right? So, you know. And I, I, you're right, because I can, I've heard her stories, they sound worse when she talks about, it's like a kid who's the owner, right? Like, oh, you know, God, the parents paid yeah. for it, but like, me now, right? yeah. Yeah, it's like oh, I can't, I can't even fathom what she's going through. So yeah. I've had to make sure I personally have taken that as a responsibility to me to make sure that I hear her when she's going through those things and just be there to listen. But I've had yeah. to learn that. I've, I, I didn't know I'd understand that at the beginning. I would just ignore it, especially when we were first dating. Like I could never have been there for her the way I am now. <laughs> But and now you can, when she's like describing that, you can say, what's the best thing I could do to support you right now? Yeah. There you go. And if you say it from a heart-based place, you, the 50% of the healing just happened in, in that sending of the energy with the question, because it's giving her a safe place to just be with everything she just experienced. Oh, and again, four or five years ago, if I said those words, they were transactional, right? Yes. Whereas now- just on the mental level. Give me that grocery list and I'll check those things off for you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's easy to say the words transactionally, but do you actually truly mean them? Is it? And I would say you have the emotional energy going along with it. Is how I would yeah. phrase that. Yeah. yeah. And, and and I will say I don't know if it's a women thing or a man thing, but you ladies are very intuitive to that. You could pick up on our BS. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I think women are conditioned in our culture to play better on the emotional playing field and men are conditioned to play better on the, on the mental and physical playing field. So if we think of it like, like fields, you know, uh, playing fields at a high school and the mental field is the baseball field and the physical is the football and the emotional is like lacrosse, right? You, unless you're a guy who plays lacrosse, you walk on that field like, I don't even get what's happening here. <laughs> there's a ball that's throwing, there's people running with these little, I don't even understand. Right. So, so women tend, you know, everybody wants to play a game they, they're good at. So women are going to tend towards the lacrosse and the emotional playing field, and the men are going to tend towards that physical or mental approach because they feel more skillful at it. Hmm. Well, now, do you get into some of that in the book as well? I do get into some of that in the book, yeah. Okay. And, and differences between, you know, how we talk to each other about things and how, and, and men and women struggle with relating in a way that is meaningful to the other person, right? And, and so when people just say, oh, you know, we don't communicate well, it's really, you know, we're, we're hearing what we think we're afraid we're going to hear. Hmm. Wow. If I'm worried that my partner doesn't respect me. Then everything he says, I hear in terms of like, see, see how he doesn't respect me. You know, we're hearing, we're listening for the evidence that'll prove our worst fear true. Yes. And then there's also the guys like early in the relationship, you're, you're listening just enough to, to try and, you know, fix it or give them the right answer. And it's like, that's right. not, that's not active listening, active no, listening. That's listening to problem solve. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, I love this. This is great. Well, I mean, l listen, this has been an amazing show and I'm glad we got to geek a little bit on me. Cause I, I love <laughs> the fact you picked up on some of this because again, the hairs were coming up on the arm, goosebumps are kicking. I'm like, yep, she's firing on it. Uh, but again, if this was four years ago and you and I did this, you would have told me that. And I would have been like, uh, yeah, you know what? What? If it was four years ago. I wouldn't have told it to you that way. So yeah. if, somebody, if somebody is like when I work with some of the corporate CEOs and stuff, men or women, they're so locked down emotionally, they can only get in mentally and physically. So I'm going to come in with quantum physics and I'm going to come in with little bits of science and I'm going to inch my way in talking about, you know, how adrenaline and cortisol can substitute for emotion and how we want to turn those down because cortisol is like battery acid in your system and it's eroding, you know. So I'd come at it from a different standpoint because you're right, you're, you know, part of this is being, I think, a good intuitive is be, knowing how to read your audience and like, what is this person ready to hear? And, mm -hmm. and I think coming from corporate America and coming from this legal profession, which was such aggressive male energy that I had, to now being an intuitive, which is all about female energy, you know, hopefully I can build a bridge between where my client is and where they want to get to. It sounds to me like you can. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I'm good with it. <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, well, listen, I want to, we, we definitely got to bring the show to a close, but uh, I want to remind people here and, and you're the guest co-host. So you actually get to close the show with some final words, but I just want to do a last screen share for the video feed. Again, okay. ladies and gentlemen listening in, it's christinelang.org. The book is The Body Whisperer, Your Symptoms Tell Me Your Truth. And you just heard a little bit about me on the show today because I don't have no problem sharing. Because sharing <laughs> is caring, people. So let's get transparent. Let's get vulnerable. <laughs> Well, well, and I think 
vulnerability makes you more powerful. I, and I'm, I, I'm fully aligned with that. I've known, I've felt that energy flow at a whole different level when you embrace that. And yeah. we've talked all about that a lot more in the past probably year on this show, especially a lot of guys I bring on. I really try and see how they react to that when I try and get them to talk about that. Yeah, and yeah. there's been some high level people on that are embracing that. And that's why I truly feel they have become high level people. And Absolutely. I think we all can embrace that a little bit more. Uh, but listen, so how would you, what are some final words that you would want to close out the show with? Like besides all the awesome nuggets and knowledge we got to share today and, and you actually tapping into me awesome at, at the end there, but uh, how would you like to close this out? Like what are some things for the listeners that you think that people need to be reminded about or what's your all encompassing message right now? I would say uh, one of the statements I love is that things are not happening for, to you. They're happening for you. And so if you can kind of take that approach and say, okay, what is great about this for me? How is this, how is this the universe, my spirits, you know, the world trying to help me? And it, it flips our head because we tend to wake up, you know, in the Buddhist perspective, you know, it, everybody's on the me plan. And from the minute we wake up, we're like, will this make me feel better? Will this make me happier? Will this make me get what, I, what I've earned? And getting off the me plan is sometimes about acknowledging everything else out there and that there's, there's a perfection to what's happening. And there's, there's, you know, things that are happening that are assisting you all the time, assisting you in getting more self-awareness, being more vulnerable, being more accurate in your self-assessment, and then loving more fully so you can be loved more fully. Mm. Well, that I agree with as far as being the whole love component there at the end. I, I totally agree with it. But <laughs> I love what you just went here with because initially when I heard it, uh, for listeners as we're closing out, is that it started this, I, the word that popped in my head was, oh, I, I don't want to be, sound too selfish, right? Mm -hmm. But to your point is, it's okay in the beginning. What I'm hearing is sometimes you got to be a little selfish in the beginning so you can become, make yourself become more aware to your benefit. Okay, then so you I have, one final point I want to make then. Okay. Yeah, help I us out. I want to differentiate between selfish and self-honoring. Ooh, there's a bomb. Selfish is saying, I don't, this is what's good for me and I don't care if it hurts everybody else. Self-honoring mm -hmm. says, I trust that if I get myself to a good place, I'll be good for everybody that way. Now that's powerful. Okay. So self-honoring, and, and it, that's a phrase we were never even given growing up. You were either selfish or you were a good person who was doing for others. Yeah. What? Two options. There's no, there's no middle road. Middle road is being self-honoring because if something's good for you, I promise you it's good for every single person you're in relationship with. There's no exceptions to that rule. And if something is bad for you, it is also bad for everybody you're in relationship with. Wow. Well, that's a more powerful way to close out the show. <laughs> okay. Bombs are dropped, ladies and gentlemen. Well, listen, hang tight. I want to give you a proper goodbye off the air. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I can't say it any better. Uh, and let's, get, let's, get, uh, let's become more self-honoring. I'm going to use that word the rest of this weekend. Okay. So, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. So, again, christinelang.org. Again, the book is online. It's available. Get it. The Body Whisperer. Your symptoms tell me your truth. So let's all become more self-honoring here in 2019. Let's change the world. Thanks for listening in to another Live the Fuel podcast. And again, we're here to fuel your health, your business, your lifestyle, and have a great 2019, ladies and gentlemen. We'll talk to you guys again soon.